After the tone, please state your name. Welcome to today's webinar, Implicit Bias in STEM, The Power of Automatic Unintended Mindsense, presented by Fred Smith. My name is Greg Nagy, and I am the Virtual Learning Community Manager from The Ohio State University, who provides technical support for the STEM Equity Pipeline Project. Before we start this presentation, I would like to go over some housekeeping items for this webinar. This webinar is scheduled to last roughly one hour and is being recorded in order to view this presentation in its entirety later. The recorded webinar will be available in the next few days on the www.stemequitypipeline.org website. As you've already found out, you will be watching the presenter present slides through the live meeting interface while listening to them talk over your phone. If you cannot get into the live meeting software to work today, you can download today's slides from the homepage of the stemequitypipeline.org website and follow along using your phone. All the attendees' phones have been automatically muted. The presenter will answer questions after the presentation. However, we can take questions at any time. This is how we take questions. At any time during the presentation and during the Q&A, you may submit a question by clicking on the button labeled Q&A at the top left of your live meeting window. Type in your question and then click the Ask button. The presenter or I will read and respond to these questions at the end of the presentation. You can download today's slides from the handout icon, icon at the top right of your live meeting window as well. I would like to start the webinar by introducing Mimi Lufkin, CEO, National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity, and the STEM Equity Pipeline Project Director. Mimi? Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Um, this is Mimi Lufkin. I'm the CEO of NAPE, and I'm uh, happy to, to have Fred Smythe here with me um, from the University of Virginia uh, to give this great webinar. I'm really excited about today's webinar. Um, one of the things, though, is as we start these webinars, we always like to know a little bit about where you heard about uh, today's webinar. So what I'm going to ask you to do is um, to go ahead and answer this poll. You can click one of the boxes um, on the screen, and it will uh, send us a vote. And let us know whether you heard it from an email from our listserv, maybe from another listserv. And you'll notice that there's the Q&A in parentheses. What that means is if you go to the Q&A function and you can tell us what listserv you um, received this information from, that helps us know uh, a little bit about who is uh, sending our information out. Um, were it, was it forwarded from a colleague's presentation at a conference? And if so, go to the Q&A and let us know what conference it was. Just stick in the Q&A box, uh, the conference, and send it to us. How about an announcement in the pipeline press from another newsletter? Um, and if it's from another newsletter, if you can tell us which new newsletter by mm -hmm. going to the Q&A box and in inserting that information. Um, and, of course, lastly, if you just happen to um, see it on our website. And I'm going to leave the polls open and show the results so that everyone can see these. There we go. Um, it looks like our listserv is functioning well and that most of the people are getting this information because we're communicating with you directly. This is really great feedback for us because uh, sometimes we don't know exactly where information is getting shared. So I'm glad to know the listserv is functioning. Let me just say a couple of words about um, the STEM Equity Pipeline Project. Uh, for those of you who maybe this is your first webinar with us, for those of you who have been on the webinar before, you can uh, take a deep breath and relax for a minute. Get ready for Fred's presentation. Um, but the, the STEM Equity Pipeline uh, project is funded by the National Science Foundation from the Gender and Science and Engineering Program. It's actually a project of our foundation. We have a, a the NAEP has a foundation that does fundraising for project development. The goals of the project, uh, there are three of them. The first one has to do basically with trying to build capacity of teachers, educators, state staff in the states that we're working on integrating um, gender equity into STEM professional development, so it's really the professional development piece. The second goal is around trying to connect our work to existing accountability systems, and in particular, we're interested in the effect that our work has on states' ability and locals' ability to meet their non-traditional performance measures in Perkins, and if that's new, new information to you, then um, there's a uh, Lots of webinars archived on our website about uh, some of that information. You can go check those out. 
And lastly is, of course, to broaden the commitment to gender equity in STEM education. We want to try to get more people to think about um, how to engage underrepresented groups in STEM education as they develop programs. We do this by conducting professional development, teacher training, consulting and technical assistance. We have, um, of course, our professional learning communities, and which includes uh, the webinars that are conducted today. And all of our webinars are um, archived shortly after they're completed on the website. So again, Greg mentioned this the introduction at the beginning. You can go to stemequitypipeline.org and under the professional development menu, you'll see a menu item that says archived webinars and you can go there. There's over 20 webinars that we've done um, available there. So how can you get involved? We're we're currently working in these 11 states, so if you're from um, any one of these states and you're not aware of what's going on in your state in regards to the efforts um, for this project, if you go to our website, um, you can contact the state contact that's in um, that state to find out more about what's happening there, and that's under the, the um, state contact. So there's a menu for states. Uh, and, of course, continuing to participate in the virtual learning community. So one of the things we always like to do to help our presenters is to learn a little bit about who is on today's webinar so that an effort can be made by Fred in this case to um, uh, sort of focus his remarks based on um, who happens to be on board. So you all are getting really good at this polling thing. Um, the results are coming in, flying in like crazy. So if uh, I'll give you just another minute if everyone would finish responding to whether which of these categories you find yourself in. And if, if you um, want to let us know through the Q&A function um, who you are, if you're none of the five uh, people above, um, that would help us too because it looks like we have quite a few other folks. So I'm going to go ahead and show the results, even though the polls are still open. So if you need to vote, please continue to vote. Um, and so, Fred, it looks like we have a, a quite a few other categories. I'm not sure what that means, but as the Q&A comes in, maybe people can let us know and that will help. But, again, it looks like we have probably most of the folks um, on today's, well, I don't know. It's a pretty even split is all I can tell you. So we're going to go with that. So your remarks will be relevant to everyone. <laughs> That's the way I planned it. <laughs> okay, good. Um, well, so let me uh, say that I'm really looking forward to um, to Fred Smythe's presentation. Let me give you a, give a quick introduction. Uh, uh, Fred is a research assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Virginia. Um, he's been involved with Project Implicit for many years, and he directs the Full Potential Initiative which is an NSF-funded longitudinal study of the development and influence of implicit attitudes about intellectual ability and academic belonging. Fred has a rather significant curriculum vita and has uh, generated a lot of publications on this topic and is particularly interested in looking at the analysis of ethnicity and gender um, around, their partic around participation in science. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and pass the mantle here to um, Fred and let you take it away. Well, thank you very much, Mimi and Greg, and to you folks tuned in. It's really great to have this chance to talk with you about the effects of implicit biases about science and gender. For more than a decade now, my University of Virginia colleague, Brian Nosek, and I have studied how implicit associations in our minds about science and gender relate to academic and career engagement. By implicit, we mean ones that operate automatically, whether or not they line up with our intentions or consciously held beliefs. The National Science Foundation has generously supported our research and education program known as the Full Potential Initiative. My goal today is to acquaint you with evidence that all of us are susceptible to the influence of implicit biases about who belongs in science. The good news is that implicit associations can change, and it's possible to guard against their unwanted influence. 
Let me start with something unrelated to science and gender. When my audience is with me in person, I joke that anyone who is a certified Taekwondo referee should disqualify themselves from this exercise. But certified or not, I'd like you to take a few seconds and make a prediction about who is going to win this bout. Now, admittedly, this is a very thin slice of the action. But for the trained observer, there is enough here to make more than a random guess. Let's call them competitors A and B. So I'd like you to take a few seconds, and I'm going to poll you on your best judgment for A or for B. And if you're feeling stuck, just go with your gut. Go with your gut. Okay. Five. Four, three, two, one. And I'm going to try and close the polls. There we go. Took me a second to get them closed, and I'm going to open up and show you the results. And it looks like competitor B has it in your estimation by a, a, a fairly good margin, probably statistically significant. So let's go back and see what the research says. It turns out that the smart money is on competitor A, unless the colors of the uniforms are switched and B is the one wearing red. That's exactly what Hageman and his team did in this study of actual Taekwondo referees. Over 40 experienced referees were asked to score well-matched competitors shown in many short film clips, about four seconds each. Without the referee's knowledge, each clip was shown twice so that the red and blue uniform colors could be reversed with digital imaging software. They found that when the same competitor was wearing red instead of blue, he was granted a statistically significant edge by the referees, enough to be the deciding factor in close bouts. The researchers concluded that an association of the color red with dominance and aggression was influencing the referees' judgments. This is a beautiful demonstration of an implicit bias at work. Surely, these referees, who averaged eight years of experience judging bouts, were not aware that uniform color was affecting their decisions. What's more, even after becoming aware of this bias, it would not be possible for referees to simply be more alert and catch themselves being influenced by red. It happens automatically, under the radar of consciousness. Findings like this, scientifically demonstrating the influence on our behavior, behavior of factors outside our awareness, began to emerge in the 1970s. Let me show you one of the classics. Volunteers were brought into a lab and shown a movie of this baby playing happily with a jack-in-the-box. When Jack popped out, the baby started to cry. People were simply asked to describe what the baby was feeling. The only trick was the baby was referred to with a girl's name for half of the volunteers and a boy's name for the other half. Nothing else about the movie was different. Those who thought the baby was a girl were more likely to perceive fear, while those who thought they were seeing a boy were more likely to perceive anger. So exactly the same behavior was interpreted differently by these observers, without their knowledge, purely because of associations in their minds about gender. 
After several decades of research, we now know that implicit biases of all sorts are the norm. If I was on jury duty and was asked by the prosecutor if I could be unbiased in considering the evidence, I'd have to say something like, I'll do my best, but no guarantees. This book, Strangers to Ourselves, by my UVA colleague Tim Wilson, is a great read if you want to learn more about the pervasive role of implicit associations behind even our most important decisions. Indeed, not even decisions about livelihoods and life or death choices are immune. We know, for example, that women fare much better in the competition for jobs with top U.S. orchestras when the auditions take place behind screens so that judges cannot know the applicant's sex. We also now know that a harmless object like a cell phone, if it is held by a black man, Oh, excuse me, I clicked a, an incorrect button. Are more likely to be perceived as a weapon than if held by a white man. Here are the main ideas I'd like to leave with you today. First, we should humbly accept that we are routinely, without awareness, influenced by automatic associations in our minds. They can be different from our conscious, conscious intentions, beliefs, and values. My talk today will not end that for you or me, but the more we learn about the operation of such implicit thoughts, the more we can influence their strength and guard against their negative consequences. Second, a large body of research makes clear that implicit associations are related to how people perform in science, technology, engineering, and math, and to whether they pursue studies and careers in these areas. Third, quite a few methods for measuring a person's implicit mindsets have been developed and validated over the past 20 years. I will introduce you to a couple of these today. And finally, we also know that our implicit biases can change sometimes very quickly. Achieving lasting change, though, takes mindfulness and ongoing effort. Here's an example of implicit bias at work behind the decisions of teachers to recommend advanced placement in math for a precocious sixth grader. They were told that the student had scored off the charts on an algebra aptitude test and that the optimal placement would be among the best seventh graders taking honors Algebra one. A trade-off, however, was that this placement would keep the student from having lunch with the other sixth graders, one of the few times for socializing during the day. Like the crying baby experiment, the teachers were randomly assigned to see either a male or female name on the student's testing record. It turns out that the female teachers were slightly more likely to recommend the female student for advanced placement. Although, as you can see by these uh, overlapping error bars here, the, that was not a statistically significant difference in their recommenda recommendations. The male teachers, on the other hand, were significantly more likely to advance the male student. So what we see here in this pattern is some evidence of sort of an in-group bias, a same gender bias in the recommendations of these teachers. The female teachers slightly more likely to advance the girl, the male teachers significantly more likely to advance the boy. So. The math placement and crying baby experiments allow us to infer the operation of implicit bias by comparing the behavior of two groups under different experimental conditions. But how do we measure an implicit bias in an individual? 
This actually happened in the experiment with the Taekwondo referees because each ref saw the competitors both ways, red and blue. So we could actually compute a red bias score for each ref by computing the difference in their scores when competitors were in red versus blue. We would expect to find that some refs show more red bias than others. Many methods for measuring implicit bias at the individual level have been developed over the past 20 years. Let me introduce you to the most popular one. The Implicit Association Test, or IAT, has been used in hundreds of published studies about all kinds of attitudes, self-concepts, and stereotypes. Let me demonstrate the basic procedure for one of the most important questions of recent weeks. Green Bay or Pittsburgh? We know who won the Super Bowl, but questions remain about implicit preferences for these two teams. The way uh, an IAT would work is sort of like this. We might see Steelers on the left-hand side of the screen and Packers on the right, and each person would be told to use a specific left-hand key to sort Steelers items and a right-hand key to sort Packers items. So, for example, a Packers helmet, I would click the right key to sort that properly into the Packers category. And a Steelers helmet would go to the left. That was training phase one. In training phase two, we would learn how to sort good and bad items. In this case, here's a smiling face. We would sort that to the left. And a frowning face would go to the bad category on the right. Now here is test phase one. Nothing has changed except both category labels now, both divisions are listed at the top. So Steelers and good items would go to the left, Packers and bad to the right. So just like before, one item at a time, Green Bay goes to the right, and a happy face goes to the left. Now after about 60 trials in test phase one, we would encounter a retraining phase where Packers and Steelers switch sides on the screen. After about 40 retraining trials, we would go to test phase two. So now left-hand keys are Packers and good, and right-hand keys, uh, excuse me, left-hand keys, are, yeah, Packers and good, and Steelers and bad on the right. So the question then becomes, which of these sorting paradigms was easier for a person? Steelers and good, Packers and bad, or the other way around? Well, we would expect that Steelers fans would have a much easier time with this sorting and Packers fans an easier time with this sorting. And by, me, by easier, I mean that they would be faster in making the clicks and make fewer mistakes. We haven't actually measured implicit preferences for NFL teams yet, but an international network of researchers led by Tony Greenwald at University of Washington Mazarin Banaji at Harvard, and Brian Nosek, my UVA colleague, has studied hundreds of other implicit associations through Project Implicit on the Internet. The site was launched in 1998, and now about 20,000 visitors each week complete a variety of IATs. A gender and science IAT is among the most popular tests, so we've been able to study results for hundreds of thousands of people. Here is one set of test categories you would see if you visit Project Implicit and choose the gender science test. We would call these the counter-stereotypical pairings. Since male and liberal arts are being sorted with one key and female and science words are sorted with another. This is the stereotypical test phase. It's important to note, by the way, that half the visitors to the site receive the counter-stereotypical phase first, and the other half receive the stereotypical phase first. This counterbalancing of the order ensures that we don't mistake some kind of order effect 
for actual differences in sorting difficulty between the two phases. It turns out that among the project implicit visitors, about 70% find this stereotypical sorting pattern easier, whereas only 10% find the counter stereotypical pattern easier. The other 20% land somewhere in the middle. That is, it's not differentially easy for them to strike the keys in either condition. This graph gives a more detailed look at variation in gender science bias scores. The white bars in the middle show the 20% of scores that do not differ across the sorting phases. The zero point indicates that there was no difference in speed of responding between the two phases for people in this range. As we move away from the zero point, in either direction, the scores reflect stronger implicit bias in the given direction. The different levels of scores tell us that people vary in the strength of their bias. But what about men and women? If you look at these two graphs split out from our male and female respondents, you see that they look almost identical. However, if you stopped here and didn't look beneath the surface at some key identity characteristics of these respondents, we would, we would be making a mistake. And it turns out that the self-reported or self-endorsed academic identity of these participants makes a big difference. In this graph, I'm going to show you the average scores for women and men within 12 different categories of college majors. The majors are roughly ordered from left to right in terms of how much science content they require. The vertical axis now is the reference for the IAT scores, with scores higher up indicating stronger science equals male bias. Here are the averages for women in each major. The line segments connecting the points just help us to see the relative position of each average. The general pattern is that as majors contain more science content moving from left to right, the average implicit bias of women in these majors gets weaker and weaker. The women in the predominantly non-science majors on the left have the strongest science equals male bias, while those in the science majors on the right have the weakest bias. It is notable, however, that none of the averages break across the zero line into the counter-stereotypical direction. Even the women who identify themselves within the most scientific majors still slightly associate science with male at an implicit level. The averages for men are like a mirror image. Those in the science majors have the strongest stereotypes of all men. When we compare men and women in the biological and physical sciences, therefore, the gender gap in implicit bias that we observe is about as large as any psychological sex difference we ever see. So we see that identity matters. Specifically, in this case, it's the combination of two identities that matter, our gender and our personal level of identification with science. We also know that implicit stereotypes vary with different environments. Citizens of hundreds of countries around the world visit Project Implicit, and we noticed that the average levels of implicit gender science bias varied from country to country. We wondered if gender differences in science and math performance in these countries were related to the country differences we were seeing in implicit bias. To answer this question, 
we looked at results of the international TIMS math and science tests. These standardized tests are given to the children of participating countries every four years. The vertical axis of this graph shows the difference between eighth grade boys and girls TIMS science scores. A score of 10, for example, means that the average score of boys was 10 points higher than that of girls in a given country. The scores extending from left to right along the horizontal axis show increasing average gender science IAT scores earned by citizens of the nations participating in the TIMS testing. That is, the scores of citizens who decided to visit the Project Implicit website and take the gender science IAT. Notice again that the IAT scale does not extend as low as zero on the left because every country's average was at least somewhat in the direction of the science equals male bias. Here are the results for the 34 TIMS nations in 2003. So each of these dots represents the place where the gender difference in science is and the IAT average for citizens coming to our site is. We see an increasing diagonal pattern indicating that in countries where boys outscored girls by greater amounts, citizens of those countries taking the gender science IAT exhibited greater bias. As one goes up, the other tends to go up. For those who like to think in terms of correlations, it was 0.6. We published these results in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science and speculate that each factor influences the other. That is, we think conditions of gender equity on the ground whether indicated by test performance differences or different gender proportions among science faculties, probably influence citizens' implicit biases. And in the other direction, implicit biases may shape students' self-identification and engagement with different subject areas and lead to different average group performances. Here is another important demonstration of the impact of environments on implicit biases. Sedensek and colleagues found that American children as early as second grade demonstrated the cultural stereotype that math is for boys on both implicit and explicit measures. They also found that boys identified with math more strongly than did girls on both implicit and self-report measures. This is remarkable given that boys and girls do not differ in objective math achievement at these ages. Here we see the expected pattern on a gender identity IAT. Boys were much faster to associate themselves with male and girls much faster associating themselves with female. If we did not observe this pattern, we would have to wonder whether the IAT methodology was working with these young children. Here we see the math gender stereotype results. Both boys and girls already implicitly associated math with male. The arrangement of this graph shows the boys associating math with their own gender and the girls associating it with opposite gender. So if we flip the girls' average around for a moment, we can look at each plot in the male-biased direction and see that they are roughly the same. And this reminds us of that plot of men and women adults from Project Implicit, seeing that their implicit level of implicit bias was about the same overall. Finally, here are the math self-concept results. Boys already are slightly associating themselves more strongly with math and girls more strongly with reading. Here is evidence of rapid environmental effects on implicit associations. Stout and her colleagues 
studied students in first-year calculus at a large university who were randomly assigned to either a female or male professor. Higher scores on the vertical axis indicate stronger implicit associations of the self with math. They found that the implicit math identity of male students was unaffected by the sex of their professor. Notice that the standard error bars overlap, indicating that these averages are not significantly different from one another. For the female students, however, the effect of professor's sex was dramatic. While learning from a female professor, the women's implicit math identity was similar to the men's. But the women learning from a male professor suffered a great dampening of their implicit identification with math. Stout and colleagues propose a stereotype inoculation model, where inoculation occurs by contact with successful female role models and bolsters STEM self-concept, attitude, self-efficacy, and goals. So we've established that identities and environments can affect implicit associations about STEM. But we're left with the question of, so what? What is the effect of strong or weak implicit self-concepts or stereotypes? Do elementary school girls with relatively weak implicit math stereotypes and strong implicit math self-concepts stand a better chance of achieving highly and persisting in STEM fields? This is the current hotbed of research. Let me show you some costs of implicit bias for female engineering students, demonstrated by Logel and her colleagues. They created an implicit measure of sexism by asking volunteers to complete a collection of sentence fragments, like this one. Jenny went home to cook dinner, and each participant would complete that sentence fragment at, as he or she chose. Later, independent judges rated the sentence completions on a one to five scale for degree of sexism. Here are a few examples of the completions submitted for this sentence. Think about the one to five sexism score you would give to each. Jenny went home to cook dinner for her husband. Naked. Because Tim cooked dinner last night. After work. You can guess, just going back a slide, you can guess that the first two completions received high sexism ratings and the last two received low ones. The researchers found that when female engineering students interacted with men who scored highly on this indicator of sexism, they did worse on a math test compared with those who interacted with a low sexism man. In neither case, by the way, did the women or the men know that the men even had a sexism rating. This graph shows the results for the women in math and the women on an English test. In the English test, the sexism of the man they interacted with made no difference. But in the stereotyped math field, interacting with the no sexist men or the low sexist men allowed them, the women to score much better on the math test than if they had interacted with the high sexism man. So, what to do? Education about implicit bias, like what you've experienced today, is an important but not sufficient step on the way to changing or counteracting unwanted biases. For this awareness to translate into meaningful change, we need to measure trends in interest, performance, and perseverance. If we find group differences in such indicators, this is not proof of the operation of implicit bias but we would be alert to the possibility. We might realize 
that a restructuring of a decision-making process could make a difference, like introducing blind auditions did for women in U.S. orchestras. Or, as Hageman and his colleagues suggested, avoiding red gear in Taekwondo belts. We have much to learn about how implicit associations develop and influence behavior over extended periods. Longitudinal studies, for instance, following up those elementary school students every few years is a key next step. More collaboration between researchers like me and practitioners like you will advance this kind of understanding. Redoing associations, that is, strengthening ones we want, is more effective than just saying no to ones we don't want. The stereotype inoculation model suggests that girls and women benefit from exposure to accomplished female role models. This does not mean that male scientists like me should not be teaching girls or women, but it does suggest that we might want to be particularly aware and creative in helping our female students make personal connections with a future in STEM. As we see from the study of elementary school students, they are already being influenced by stereotypes in the environment. So we should take every opportunity to bolster associations between girls, women, and STEM domains. People's stereotypes about gender, math, and science often relate to notions of hardwired genetic sex differences. Yet we have seen gender gaps in high school math and science achievement evaporate over the last several decades. So we know that the role of the environment and attitudes is very powerful. Carol Dweck has been the leading researcher demonstrating that students who think of intelligence as something that can be strengthened, like a muscle, rather than as a you-have-it-or-you-don't kind of thing, have much better achievement outcomes in the long run, especially in areas where they are stereotyped. Here is a sampler of her publications that would be excellent resources. I'll leave you today with insights about implicit gender science, a gender bias in science, from former Harvard president Lawrence Summers. You probably recall some of the controversy over his comments in January of 2005, when he gave short shrift to social psychological causes for the science gender gap at elite universities, instead emphasizing hardwired explanations. Three months later, however, after learning more about the current state of research evidence, he had this advice. Any of us who think that we can, for ourselves, judge whether we are biased or not are probably making a serious mistake. So we all need to think about what we can learn from data about our own unconscious biases and think structurally about what to do about those biases. Thank you for your interest today. I look forward to hearing your ideas and questions. Don't hesitate to email me if questions come up later or if you have ideas for research collaborations with FBI. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. This was this was fantastic. I have to say that I had to mute my phone because occasionally I was gasping and squawking and <laughs> doing other things while you were presenting, or at least wanting to. So um, very, very interesting information. And, um, you know, I have taken the implicit bias test. I will not share my results with you, however. <laughs> But I did um, find that the results were very informative, and I would like to encourage everyone who's on the call to, um, you know, whether you do it immediately after the webinar or later, uh, to go ahead and, and take the implicit association test. Um, Fred, we have one, one question that came up on the Q&A, and let me just say to everyone that's still on the call, you know, Fred is here to answer your questions now. 
Um, and the way we'd like to um, handle this initially is to have you go ahead and submit your questions via the Q&A function um, in live meeting. You'll notice at the top of your screen there is a menu item titled Q&A. If you click on it, you can enter your questions there and then send them to us, and um, we will ask them, and uh, Fred will give his response. It's easier for us to manage the questions this way rather than opening the phone lines, which then creates a lot of background noise. So, Fred, we have one question that relates back to a graph that was in a previous slide. So I don't know if you'll have to go back and look at it or if you will recall this, but um, Brianna asks, I noticed – that the end in the project implicit graph with all college majors had nearly 40,000 person difference, more females than were asked than males. Do you, is there a reason for this? Do you remember which one this was? Yes, and, and I brought it up. I don't know if that is visible to everyone. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, yes, that's a, that's a, a great question. Um, uh, and this is strictly a function of people deciding to visit, and we do generally, uh, across all of our uh, various tasks on Project Implicit, tend to see more participation by women coming onto the site. Okay. Um, and in, but, but in gender science, that is a fairly typical gender distribution. Now, the important thing to notice about that graph is you can see there are very tiny, these are standard error bars for each average, these little, uh, uh, look like capital I's. And that gives us uh, the ability to say how confident we are in that uh, point estimate. And so since uh, any place that those bars would, say, overlap for a, uh, the, the female group and the male group, then we would have to say, well, there's not a significant difference. Um, the only place where they overlap is here uh, for the business majors. In every other case, there is a statistically significant difference. Now, given that these numbers are so large, many thousands, uh, we could look at a difference, say, like this one in psychology, for example. And even though that's statistically significant, it, it isn't a very big difference. It's probably not what we would call an important difference. However, these differences out here um, are very large. Um, for those who are accustomed to, th to uh, thinking about uh, D scores uh, at the effect size measure, these are about 0.8, uh, which is very big. So the, the answer to your question is that the, the difference in numbers here do not uh, affect uh, our inferences about the sex differences in the implicit bias. I was struck really quite strongly by this particular slide because it made me think about the fact that, um, and you and you mentioned this in your closing comments about the fact that we have many men who are teaching in the fields engineering, math, physical sciences, biology, life sciences, who may. Um, in their own right, carry implicit bias about the association that they have with the girls in their classroom. Now, you're a very enlightened person. Obviously, this is something you care a lot about. Um, and, you know, we we also in our work are, are uh, concerned about making sure that we have more role models in the classroom. And, and I don't know if you have suggestions, but... Um, I think this whole notion around inoculation by bringing in uh, non-traditional role models and women who are in the sciences can be very helpful and is a good suggestion for teachers to consider in any way, shape, or form that they can, especially uh, male teachers. Yes, and, uh, I agree, and, I, and I, that's why I say I think we, we have to, to be as thoughtful and creative as, as we can uh, to – to spur uh, exposure and introduction to um, female, uh, su successful female scientists, practitioners, um, doing interesting and engaging work. And there, there are, as sure I'm, as, as <clears throat> um, your audience knows probably much better than I do, many of these resources out there, uh, especially on the internet these days. But 
um, bringing them into into the classroom um, whenever possible, I think, will have uh, an important effect. Um, <clears throat> and likewise, we see I, I, ha I presented uh, this kind of information to a gathering of computer science teachers here at University of Virginia over the summer, and afterwards, uh, one of one of these teachers mentioned to me um, his idea that you know, gee, uh, as students progress in their schooling, often at the higher levels, as the math becomes more difficult, that's when they become more likely to encounter a man teaching the field, and. He hypothesized that that might be yet another uh, uh, blow, uh, you know, sort of strengthening the, the male equals math stereotype. So uh, we men, I think, have a, a particular need to be mindful about ways to um, create uh, exposure to uh, the exciting work being done by women in STEM domains. Um. There's a question, actually two questions, sort of regarding geographic bias and the notion that you brought up um, in your slide around the differences between um, uh, performance on on the TIMS uh, scores. I think, yeah, there we go. And countries. And so there was one one con one question about um, about which country citizens seem to have the least stereotypes or stereotypical attitudes, and, I, you know, you may want to help us define what some of these acronyms are here at the bottom representing which countries. But there was also a question about whether or not there's any data about gender bias in the U.S. by geographic region. Has anyone done any studies regarding that that you know of? Uh, not that I know of, um, but we, uh, we certainly have the capability to do that kind of research. Um, because certainly uh, U.S. citizens are by far the uh, largest um, representation at our site. And we do ask people to um, supply uh, zip code information. Well, I should say, I should qualify that. On the demonstration uh, website, which is where people go and take the gender science task, uh, I'm not sure that we do ask zip code off the top of my head. Uh, right. When you, you folks should look for that when you go take the test. Certainly when people elect to go in through the research portal on the Project Implicit site, and let me just flip back to that um, interface uh, page. So here, um, here's where the majority of people enter. They, they go in through the demonstration site, they want to try out an IAT or two or, or more of their choosing. But a, a significant number um, on the order of uh, 1,000 or 2,000 every week go in through this research portal, and there they provide more demographic background, and they basically uh, volunteer to be research participants, and they are then randomly assigned to different research studies uh, going on at the time. And I've conducted many on the site involving STEM domains. And so for those people, I would have uh, uh, zip code data if they chose to report it. So that's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, and uh, I, I will give uh, a reference to this webinar if I end up publishing a paper on that. Great. <laughs> I do know that the, the United Nations um, and again, I don't know that, that you've thought about this, but I, if you could go back to the slide um, that shows the countries, that the United Nations actually scores countries in their, their gender equity. They get gender equity scores to various countries based on a variety of topics. And, and um, I don't know if there's any association between this. I suspect not, but... Is J? Can you tell me what JOR stands for? That uh, Jordan. Jordan. Right. So it's interesting to see that Jordan, um, and I don't know what MDA or MKD. I think MDA is Moldova. Oh, so okay. Um, and I'm not sure you, uh, I'm going to be able to recall all. <laughs> oh no, that's okay. But is IRN Iran? Um, that's a good. Yes, I don't. I, I can't say I recall off the top of yeah. my head. I can tell you. Yeah, go ahead. 
Well, I just I was just going to say that in countries where when you think about um, women's role or their place in society um, is not exactly what I would call gender equitable. That their scores on that this this is very interesting. That their um, association with when we see this in a lot of things, their association with math and female, it's not a connection that's related to any other societal biases that appear to be going on in their societies. Um, and I, I often find in our work that people, um, when they start to hear about how different this whole thing is in in other countries around the world, that then they begin to understand that it's something, there's something in our societal nature and the way in which we deal with gender that there's an association between um, the success in math and science and, and our societal biases. Do you agree with that? I mean, we're pretty high up on the scale here. <laughs> Off to the right. Uh, yes, I, I, I certainly think, you know, that uh, a take-home message here is that environments have an effect. Yeah. Uh, but the other, the complementary take-home finding, or a complementary one, is that our personal exposures and our the, the, the micro-environments that we build can have an effect even in the midst of a, a larger sea of uh, a biased tendency. And so we see that with the women who are reporting that they were science majors. Um, and, and yet they're still swimming in that sea, so they, they don't tend to average uh, a bias in the counter-stereotypical direction. Uh, I'm, I'm, as I'm looking at this plot, I'm seeing, for example, um, Romania. Uh, I, I believe that's Romania, and and they are standing fairly high up. Uh, even though I know that uh, uh, women in science and math have a, a, a strong and a much longer tradition in Romania than uh, in in Western uh, countries. Yeah. So uh, still, so again, different um, societal uh, stereotypes can still be. Pro- pervasive and influential. Uh, and again, th- this is, uh, we have found that there is this relationship um, between these scores, but these are people electing to come on to our site and take and take the, the, the uh, test. Um, and uh, I think that the general message is environment, environments matter. And so uh, do what we can Uh, take the steps we can in our environment, and we can have an impact. So I'm going to ask you one more question, which is sort of a message question about how, well, have you found faculty at the University of Virginia receptive and open to this information? Actually, this is a question from um, one of our participants, Lori. And And she'd like to know, I mean, how do you stimulate your colleagues' interest in this particular issue. And I, and I want to add to that and think about all the folks that are on the phone. You know, you're singing to the choir here, I suspect. And how does this choir <laughs> then go out and share this information with their colleagues in their schools to make them understand that how important the environment is for girls' access to math and science? And, and have you had any success in your own institution sharing this information? Uh, yes. Yes, we have. Um, and the, our institution, uh, University of Virginia, has been uh, very encouraging of disseminating these findings in-house. In fact, I was invited to speak to all new faculty and all new graduate students joining the university this, fall, this past fall. So oh, I presented data like what you've seen today to the new faculty, the new graduate students, and had this kind of dialogue with them. So we're really uh, working to, from the opening of the door here, to provide this kind of information and awareness. Uh, I also, uh, Brian and I, my colleague here, have also presented uh, each semester for the last few years to a uh, leadership training group um, that meets um, each semester and uh, with about 30 to 40 um, uh, 
high-level administrators, faculty, and staff, people who are either already in leadership positions or are um, in line or have clear potential to become leaders, we're presenting this kind of information to them systematically. Uh, so there's been good receptivity. Um, next month, I'm, uh, I've been invited up to uh, uh, Rutgers University uh, in the Camden campus to present to their faculty this kind of information. So I think uh, getting uh, exposure to this kind of research, just as Larry Summers did, is quite eye-opening and, and alerts us to the impact, the, the substantive impact of uh, this below-the-radar kind of mental functioning that, that we don't see. And we hear talk about um, uh, free choices being made by uh, women, for example, to either opt in or opt out of science and math. And what the research I've shared with you allows us to, to understand is that uh, ostensibly freely made choices by the time you're, say, an 18-year-old choosing a major have been getting influenced uh, without uh, conscious awareness for one's entire life leading up into that point. So these ostensibly free choices uh, are, are indeed being shaped by uh, factors in our society. Um, the more we're alert to that, the more we can uh, work to strengthen other kinds of associations. Well, Fred, I want to thank you so much. Uh, this webinar today was, was really incredibly fascinating, and I'd love to keep asking you all kinds of questions, but it's, our time has run out. I want to remind everyone on today's call that this webinar will be archived on the STEM Equity Pipeline website. Um, if you go to uh, www.stemequitypipeline.org, under the Professional Development menu, there is an archive webinars section of the site. This webinar and lots of other webinars are there. I also want to remind you that on March 22nd, we will be having another webinar, this one um, with Angela Byers Winston. Uh, Director of Research Initiatives at the School of Medicine and Public Health at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And uh, this webinar will be on cognitive beliefs and cultural variables that matter in STEM career development. Again, Fred Smythe, I thank you very much for your presentation, and I'm going to go ahead and pass this back to Greg Nagy, who has a few housekeeping items to take care of before we close the webinar today. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you. Actually, there's only one more thing. Um, you should be getting a, uh, an email with a link to a survey that we would like for you to fill out for us, and that should be coming in your email shortly after this webinar ends. And that is it. Thank you very much, everyone.